Save Queen of Sheba by Louise Moweri Chapter 15 It was the longest night he had ever lived through. He slept hardly at all, dozing briefly and then starting up at every tiny sound. A puff of wind, the stamp of Maggie's hooves, the call of a coyote. His mind was so active it was like a nest of mice inside his head with ideas jumping and leaping in all directions. Doubts tormented him. Was Queen of Sheba still here? Would he find her? And then if he found her, did they have enough food and strength to keep them going till they could make it back to the track of the wagon train? And then follow after the train, maybe even as far as Fort Laramie itself? More time had been lost, and they had only so much time. Long before daybreak, he was awake. He heard Maggie grazing comfortably, and he got up once to see if the little pools had again filled with water. They had risen a few inches. Not enough to fill the canteens, but enough to give him and the horse a drink to start with. And maybe there was more water farther down the draw. It was barely daylight. When it was barely daylight, he untied the horse let her to the spring and let her drink. He drank too, although Maggie had stirred up the water and it had sand and mosses in it. At last they were as ready as they ever would be. King David decided not to eat anything. The supply of cornmeal was now very low. But just to push on and see what the day brought. He had examined the shoes carefully in the first light to make certain they were the ones Queen of Sheba had been wearing. But he knew they were. They were perfectly familiar, from the scuffed toes and scratched soles to the missing button on the left one. He placed the shoes inside his shirt, like a ta talisman, and led Maggie away down the draw. The sun rose and the air began to lose its early morning chill. At times the pools of water petered out as they went forward, and there was no single blade of grass or willow tree. Then he would round a bend in the ravine and find a thread of water, a tiny patch of shade in a clump of stubby willows. Once he was able to scoop a cup or two of water into one of the canteens. But with every passing moment, he was getting farther from the wagon track. How long could he go on? How long could he risk going on with, that, with the search? An hour had passed, and the sun was hot as he led Maggie around a sharp bend. Ahead he could see that the draw looked more open, and a clump of willows thrust up green and inviting. He yanked on Maggie's rope, stumbled around an outcrop of rocks, and saw her. Chapter 16 Queen of Sheba was crouched over a tiny pool. She sat on the muddy ground, bent forward, staring down at the trickle of water. Her sunbonnet hung down her back, and her face was blistered by the sun. Listlessly, she patted the mud with one hand and leaned on the other. She was making mud pies. King David sucked in a deep breath, ready to shout her name, scream, or cry, and suddenly stopped. There was another child beside the pool. Behind Queen of Sheba, on the other side of the water hole, sat a small brown boy, nearly naked, with jet black hair hanging down his back. His skin was coppery brown, his face broad, and he crouched there silent as a rabbit, silent as a stone, watching Queen of Sheba, an Indian boy. Go get her, a voice shouted noiselessly in King David's head. Go get her, and get her away from here, fast. But as he stepped forward, someone else stepped forward out of the willows. It was an Indian woman. 
She had a basket in one hand and a knife in the other. She must have been gathering roots. The Indian woman took in the scene much faster than he had. Saw him, King David, there fifty feet away, weary, swaying. Even saw that he carried the rifle muzzle down at his side. She dropped her basket and stepped forward, seized Queen of Sheba by the arm and dragged her up. Queen of Sheba looked up wildly, and a tiny cry sounded across the glade. The Indian woman glared at King David defiantly. Steel. He could read her mind clear across the hot, grass-scented swall. I'll steal this child. Steal this child with the golden hair. But he could not let the woman do that. Even as he raised the rifle, fumbled a cap into place, he told himself that he could not let Queen of Sheba disappear from his sight ever again. The Indian woman had courage. As he leveled the rifle, aimed at the breast of her fringed and beaded skin dress, she faced him without flinching, her eyes black and bright above the two vermilion circles on her cheeks, and slowly she brought her knife up to Queen of Sheba's throat. Without a sound, King David slowly swung the barrel of the rifle till it was sighted on the Indian child. A moment passed. Another. King David began to hear a ringing in his ears. He was very tired. And it got louder and louder as he sighted down the long barrel of the sharps. With the cruel lessons of the massacre branded on his mind, he could almost smell the blood, knew what the sound would be, how the small body would jerk and fling and explode if he pulled the trigger. Kill them, screamed Queen of Sheba. There was a roaring in his head. Pa, what shall I do? King David, shoot! Queen of Sheba's voice was shrill, terrified. Her face was almost unrecognizable. But Pa would know her. Pa knew everything. Pa knew when to shoot, when to bluff, when to move, and when to wait. I got to win here, he told himself. Pa would win. I got to win. Slowly, slowly King David lowered the barrel of the gun, lowered it till it pointed harmlessly at the ground. Gambling, he said to himself. I'm gambling with Queen of Sheba's life. But I can either tell Pa I killed an Indian and lost Queen of Sheba. Or, moving as if her arms had frozen, the Indian woman slowly opened her fingers, released Queen of Sheba. As if shot from a bow, Queen of Sheba sprang forward, raced up the slope, shrieking, Kill them! Kill them! King David let Queen of Sheba run past him. He held the rifles ready, but down a little. Silently, her eyes on King David's face, the Indian woman reached for her child. She seized his arm and turned him, led him through the willows. Then she grabbed him and started to scramble up the far slope of the ravine. King David grabbed Queen of Sheba with one hand and Maggie's rope with the other and started to run. Chapter 17 The cornmeal was completely gone. King David had turned the bag inside out to get the very last crumbs, dribbling them carefully into Queen of Sheba's little hand so she could lick them up. She ate them hungrily without complaining. Sitting close to her, he could see the deep hollows in her neck and cheeks the thinness of her arms and legs, the blue shadows under her eyes. Days of hunger, of walking endless mile after endless mile, nights sleeping on the cold, hard ground, had taken a to heavy toll on her. She seemed fragile, brittle, like a child made out of dry twigs. Why don't you throw away that old piece of wood, he said. It ain't really a doll, and it's too heavy for you to carry. Queen of Shiva roused briefly. 
She raised the lumpy wooden form and laid it over her shoulder, patting her hand on its back. No, she said with faint defiance. This is my baby, my little girl. She's mine and I love her. I got to tell Margaret Ann Beachman how I saved her from the Indians. King David stared in surprise. A few days ago, she had planned to scalp the doll, and then it had been a corpse to be buried. Puzzled, but with understanding beginning, like a seed to sprout and grow, he muttered in wonder. All in what she sees, all in what she sees. At last, King David stood up and looked around. He figured they had probably covered four or five miles from the place where he had found Queen of Sheba with the Indians. And now, after a short rest, it was time to press on. He guessed that the Indian woman had done nothing to sound an alarm, since there had been no pursuit. Maybe she too knew that she had to win. He and Queen of Sheba would both be dead now, King David thought if he had fired so much as a single shot back there at the water hole. I got to tell Pa, he thought wearily. I got to tell Pa about not shooting the Indian boy, about how both me and the Indian woman won, like Queen of Sheba's got to tell Margaret Ann Beachman about the doll. With great effort, he picked Queen of Sheba up and sat her on the horse. No more could he trust her to follow, or even let his attention wander from her for more than a moment. It was clear to him that they were now making their last effort, and whatever his feelings about his sister had been yesterday, today he knew that they would make it together, or not at all. He had tried his best to figure out what to do. With time running out on them, he could not afford to waste one step, one minute, and that many had to not been able to backtrack yesterday's trail to where he had turned off to find Queen of Sheba. Instead, they must lay a diagonal course to try to bring them back to the point where he had discovered the child's absence. That would bring them back to the wagon track, and the only hope they had. Now with the noon sun high behind them and slowly coming around to where it beat on the sides of their faces, King David sighted across the land in the direction they must go. He carried the sharps, loaded, in one hand so as to be ready for anything that might happen, even though its weight strained the weakened muscles of his arms. Queen of Sheba rode, swaying to the horse's gait, sometimes quiet, and sometimes talking to herself. Margaret Ian Beachman, he heard her mutter once, Margaret Ian Beachman. After about two hours of travel, he halted the horse and lifted Queen of Sheba down, and after drinking the last of the water, they sat for some time, resting and simply staring off toward the horizon. An idle wind drifted over the empty wasteland, and heat shimmered in the distance. Ranges of hills were rising ahead now, and their blue flanks looked cool and remote. King David wondered if they would make it to the hills, he wondered, too, why he had tried so hard to save himself and Queen of Sheba against such hopeless odds. Why had he gone back for Queen of Sheba? Pa, he'd know. Pa, he knows everything. I'll have to ask Pa why I went back. Queen of Sheba stirred. Are we almost there, King David? Her eyes were sunken but still she held the doll against her breast. Almost there, promised King David. Almost there. I got to show Margaret Ann Beachman my doll and tell her how we rescued it from the Indians. Yeah, we'll tell her. Come on, we gotta get started. With arms that trembled, he lifted Queen of Sheba and got her back onto the horse. Got to keep moving got to keep moving. As the horse settled into her shuffling gait, it seemed that the creak and jingle of her harness made a sound. Got to keep moving. Got to keep moving. In the late afternoon, he began to know that they could not go on much longer. Even the fact that his plan had worked 
and they had now struck the wagon trail, again did not seem very important. Hunger was tearing a hole in him, and his legs were like wet straw, ready to fold at every step. Food. Food. If only they had something to eat. And then, incredibly, he saw a rabbit. It was a big one, loping slowly up the rise to his left. Without a moment's thought about scaring the horse, frantic to secure food before they both starved, King David slipped a cap out of the box and onto the nipple of the sharps, raised it to aim. The gun trembled in his weak arms. He sighted, fired, and the rabbit dropped over. I got him! I got him! he cried. Behind him, Maggie squealed and ro reared. In a moment, Queen of Sheba, too weak to hold on to the harness, slipped off the horse and crashed to the ground. Maggie threw up her head and broke into a stumbling gallop. With the smoking rifle still raised, King David watched paralyzed as the horse charged up the slope ahead of them. Frantically, he ran back to Queen of Sheba, seized her arm, dragged her up. She was dazed and bleeding from a cut on her face, but still she clung to the doll. Get up, he gasped. I'll get the rabbit. In a minute. Help me catch the horse. You head her off to the right. But Maggie had suddenly lurched to a halt, her harness creaking and the halter rope blowing back in the wind. She stood on the crest of a hill, head up, tail flying. Her ears were pricked forward. Then she whinnied. King David froze. That meant Maggie had sighted other horses. He pushed Queen of Sheba down. Stay here. I got to go see. Maybe Indians. With the rifle up, his breath burning in his chest, he stumbled forward, fumbling for a cap. He had only a few balls left. Suddenly dark shapes pricked the skyline over the crest of the hill. Horses. Horses. King David's ears caught the jingle of bridle bits, the creak of saddles, a shouted word. Three men rode over the crest of the hill. The rider in the lead, his face half covered with bandages and one arm in a sling, was Pa. And when he saw Pa there, tall on a tall black horse, King David knew why he had gone back to save Queen of Sheba.